Shaking my head. From side to side like there's some like something stuck inside it. <laughs> Maybe it's marble. <laughs> I don't mean to. It's just that I can't help it, you see. I stagger through these crowded streets and I can see people moving out of my way. Crossing over as if not to get too close. Contaminated, you see. Health hazard. They must think that I can't hear them. Those bloody kids. They run alongside of me, shouting names, mimicking me. Taking a piss out of how I walk. I swing my arm around awkwardly, attempting to catch... One of the little buggers. I'm not quick enough. I ended up falling against the wall. Kids laughing as I graze my face and knuckles. God, it bloody well hurts. So I throw obscenities at them. Go on, you little bastards. Piss off. Tried to crouch down a shop doorway carefully, like so as not to fall, and I slowly I produced from my inside coat pocket a bottle of cider. I make a cheers gesture to everyone passing. The stench of piss and vomit from last night's party goes still lingers in the cold morning air. And for a second it sends waves of nausea up my nostrils, hitting my stomach like a bullet at the very same time as the cider. It makes me gip. And I think I'm going to be sick, but I'm okay. It doesn't stop me from guzzling down the more of the liquid with the thirst of a man who has been starved of water for days. I pour it down my throat. I point an accusing finger at a woman with a kid. I want to tell her something, but the snotty cow walks past, takes no notice, so I wave my hand and shout at her, You! You snotty cow! You go and fuck off! I wanted to tell her that before I was like this. Before I turn into what you see now, before I started drinking, long before the rot set in, and long before the booze began to eat away at my soul, I had a kid like her. I had a good job. Aye. I bet you didn't know that, did you? Well, I did. I had a good job. And a wife. And a, I had a car. And a nice home. I had a family. Before the drink became a problem, took over, possessed me, got out of hands, so to speak. Before I became a prisoner trapped inside every unopened bottle or can. <sighs> On good days, somewhere between the first and third bottle of cheap cider or even vodka, if I'm lucky. I can recall a previous life. A painted mural of water-coloured memories that will flash before me. Well, that is until the genie in the magic bottle makes me disappear. Swish! All memories down the bedpan of life. Some nights, although I wouldn't tell anyone else this, but some nights when I stagger back to the hostel, I cry silently into the coldness of the night. 
I cry for the kid. I cry for the wife I once had. But most of all, I cry for the person I once was. The person that let himself fall inside of a cheap bottle of cider. The person who could never find the strength to fight his way back out again. The person that will stay in there until he slowly drowns. It's hard to explain sometimes. I mean, people just don't understand. They don't want to understand. Frightens them, you see. If I had a broken arm or, or stitches or even been in hospital and had an operation, then that would be different. People could see that something was wrong with me. No, not, not wrong. I, I didn't mean wrong. That was the wrong word. People just don't know how to react, what to say. I, I try not to tell people if I can help it. I can remember this one time. I was in the market and it was really crowded and I was starting to feel closed in. It was though everyone was putting up against me, breathing above me, taking my air. Anyway, I, I started to breathe more deeply, telling myself to calm down to just move away and to find a way out. But I couldn't. And my breathing was becoming more and more rapid. Little short gasps of air. I thought I was going to suffocate. I'm sure that I'd pass out. The girl behind the counter seemed to be taking forever to total up my shopping. When I finally managed to pay for them, I, I pushed people out of the way, desperately fighting to get outside. Once outside, I sat down. Right there, on the floor in front of everyone. My hand clutching a white plastic bag, which was full of tomatoes, onions, potatoes and carrots. It was as if I was holding on to an oxygen tank. <laughs> My life tucked safely inside a white plastic bag. Not one person asked if I was all right. I think they all thought I was drunk or on drugs. Everyone walked around me. No one looked and no one helped. It doesn't always happen like that. Some days I feel okay, almost happy. And somewhere far away I can actually see a glimmer of hope. Something to look forward to, maybe something to live for. And on days like these I think that maybe, just maybe, life won't always be like this. But then on other days, I call these my black days, I can hardly drag myself out of bed. I can't count the number of times I've held a razor to my arms, slowly letting the silver blade gently slide through the soft skin, watching trickles of blood run freely from the gaping wound. A sense of release, a sense of freedom. To the outside world, I probably seem crazy. Maybe I am. I feel as though I'm going crazy some days. I feel as though I'm in a whirlwind spiralling totally out of control. I once sat on the bed, unscrewed the top of a vodka bottle and carefully placed it on the bedside table. Then, after unscrewing the top of the antidepressants, I tipped them all over the bed cover. I can remember thinking how lovely the orange coat on them looked how it almost glowed in the sunlight. Then one by one, I placed them onto my tongue and swallowed them down with the vodka. Then I laid back, letting the sunlight rest on my face, warming and soothing, a feeling of contentness. And I thought of nothing, absolutely nothing. 
To wake up in a hospital with a tube shoved down your throat is not the most pleasant experience that I've ever had, although it didn't stop me from doing it another twice. Have you ever looked into a steamed up mirror? Droplets of water distorting your reflection. To look deep into the eyes only to find emptiness, no emotion or love behind them, only sadness and confusion. You see, it feels safe in there, in the dark lost far away from everyone, hidden by dark shadows that swallow me up. I don't like being me. I want to be like you. I don't know what to do to stop these thoughts and feelings, and I wish that I could climb inside of that mirror with the face that's crying condensation tears. I wish that I could climb inside and be swallowed down with all of the pain and feeling of despair. I wish that I could just disappear, vanish, never to exist again. Maybe I never really have ever existed. Maybe I'm in a dream that someone else is dreaming, living someone else's life, a life that's full of no meaning, a life that's full of nothing at all, a life that's full of no importance to anyone. One, two, three, now. No. One, two, three, now. All right, this time. One, two, three, now. Three. Three's my lucky number. If I don't count to three before I do anything, I just know that something terrible will happen. Like something might happen to one of my family. It takes me ages to get ready for work. You see, even before I can get out of bed, I have to count to three. Then, once in the bathroom, I have to count to three again before I can clean my teeth, and I have to wash my face three times, and I have to use a white flannel. And it must be a clean one every day. Everything in my drawers are stacked in piles of five. Five is a good number, too. I, I usually have cereal for breakfast. I have to tap the spoon three times on the edge of the dish. One, two, three, now! And then I can eat. Before I leave the house, I check that the cooker and oven are turned off, even if I haven't turned them on. I go along and tap each knob with my finger. One, two, three, off, 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 off. Cooker's off. One, two, three, four, five. Now the oven. One, two. One, two, three, off. One, two, three, off. Oven's off. So cooker and oven are off. Then I move over to the door. Same again. I close the door and wait. One, two, one, two, three. I try the handle just to make sure that it's locked. Then I try it twice. All the way down the street, I'm checking things off the invisible list in my head. Taps off, cookers off, ovens off, doors locked. Everything's off. And this is all whilst I'm trying to avoid the cracks in the pavement. You see, if I stand on a crack, then I have to go back to the beginning something bad will happen. Now, this can be really difficult when someone else is walking towards me and they refuse to move to one side. I either have to do this mad dance around them or freeze. I usually end up freezing, but then I have to count to three before I can carry on walking. I know what you're saying. Just stop doing it! I can't. I've tried. I have to say, OK, I'm going to stop this. This is the last time. One, two, three. Last time. But then I have to do it another twice in order to stop doing it. At work it's no easier. I have to reopen the envelopes three times and check inside before I can mail them. It drives me crazy. I bet you're wondering if I've always been like this, aren't you? Yes, I have. But it was different when I was a kid. On my way to school, I would have to count ten white cars before I could go into the school. And I hated the colour red. Why? Because red means blood. 
and that means something bad was going to happen. Oh, and names beginning with D. D means death. I don't know if you've ever done this, but when I was walking home with my mum, I used to watch her feet. Right foot, then left. I would say it over and over again. Right, left. Right, left. I would do this sort of funny jig with my feet until I was walking in step with her. I still do it now when I'm walking with someone. People look at me and must be wondering what the hell I'm doing. Sometimes I have these terrible thoughts and feelings. I think that things are going to happen to people I care about, but so long as I do the counting thing, nothing can happen. Okay, right off I go. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, one, two, three. Now, yeah. Um, one, two. Now, now, one, two, three. Now, now, now. One, two, three. Now. No, 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 wait, um, okay. One, two, three. Yeah, go on. Take a good look. Everyone does. Do you think that I'm so different from you? Well, I'm not. It's a job, nothing else. I have to make a living just like you do. Only difference is, you don't get slagged off for what you do. You don't get beat up or live in fear for your life. How old do you think I am? I bet I'm younger than you think. It's not as easy as people think. I don't just lay back and think of old England. Everyone thinks that it's a doddle. <laughs> I can't be that hard. Pick them up, do the business, get paid, piss off, next punter. Sometimes I have to leave my little one on his own. Well, that can really scare shit out of me. Being reported and all that. I mean, it's not a bear or anything. It's nine now. Some nights I'm stood outside on that street corner freezing me tits off. For what? I'll tell you. A two-minute shag, chaff legs and 20 quid. Well, that's all saying that they pay and don't just sod off. Well, I can't exactly go to police, can I? Excuse me, officer, but that bloke's just done a runner and not paid for his shag. Could you give me a description, miss? Oh, yes, officer. It looks just like any other prick I see. Just see them sorting it out, can't you? They're worse than punters. I mean, don't get me wrong. Some punters can be really nice. And they've never done anything like this before. Mind you, they all tell you that. First time and all that shite. I know that most of them are lying bastards. And they're just scared of the wives or the girlfriends finding out. And half of them must think that their first time's going to be a sodding freebie. Oh, and the stuff that they come out with. Thought that I'd got enough money on me, love. Can I drop it off tomorrow? I feel like saying, I'll just pop it onto your bonus card, I've at her. And remember, for every card that you fill, you'll receive a free shag. Oh, and then there's, If I don't go all the way, can I have it at half price? And the best one of all, as means stitches every time. Do you take plastic? Do I take plastic? What do you think my ass is? A flaming swipe machine? I tell you, I've heard it all. And the titles that we have. What's all that about then? I bet there's no one with as many titles as us. Let's see. We've been Ladies of the Night, Whores, Johnny Slappers, Chuff knows what the hell a Johnny Slapper is, but I can assure you that I've never slapped a Johnny in my life. Mind you, I've slapped a few Daves, Mix and Steves in my time. We've been referred to as Tarts, Street Girls, Street Workers, Working Girls, oh, and the Rubber Glove Gang. <laughs> now, that conjures up a right vision. 
prostitutes and the latest one, sex workers. Although I do quite like that one. It makes us sound sort of professional, doesn't it? You've got to have a sense of humour in this game. You'd go crazy if you didn't. We're sort of like a little family, us girls. Everyone knows each other and we look out for each other's kids. Sometimes you might get a punter that wants to do things different that you don't really want to do. Like you might get one that just wants straight sex. Fine, no problem. But then when he gets into it, no pun intended, he decides that it wouldn't hurt for you to just give him a blowjob. Now to refuse would normally see you going on with a broken nose. So what do you do? Easy. Well, no, it's not really. You have to try to talk your way out of it. Sometimes, though, you can't. You just have to do it. Odd ones ask if you can use bondage or S&M. Now, that really freaks me out. And some, though I know you might not believe me, don't actually want to do anything. They just want to talk. Yeah, I know. Talk. They usually talk about work or the families. To tell you the truth, I really feel sorry for them. I mean, fancy having to pay someone to listen to you say how you feel because no one else really gives a shit. I don't want to sound horrible, but the truth is that most of the time I don't care. It's a job. You make all the right noises. Pretend that you're totally interested in enjoying it. After all, it is what they're paying for. And I'm not artless. It's just that I can't get involved. I have to switch off. There's no room for sentiment or love. You give that away to those that don't think that they can buy it. I bet you're wondering why I do this, aren't you? Well, it's not because I love sex or because I was abused by a family member. And I don't take drugs or anything like that. I've got more sense than to shoot my hard-earned money up my arm. No, it's nothing like that at all. I was homeless with a bairn, and a couple of my mates took us both in. And I guess it's because what they were doing for a living, well, I just sort of followed, really. I've done it for years. Would I ever want to do anything else? Yeah, well, maybe. Bucky's door swings open. An invitation? Maybe. Not sure if I should walk past or go in. And there's voices inside of my head and they're calling, trying to reassure me that this will be the last time. The very last time. One more bed. Begin to play with the twenty pound note concealed deep within my pocket. I hesitate. The voices are now becoming louder and more demanding with every second that I wait. Now that's a sign of weakness. And I know that I might end up succumbing to the overwhelming voices that are rummaging through my brain, stealing my thoughts, invading my willpower until they conquer all. Slowly. Real slowly. This is now beginning to grow louder, stronger. There's more and more of them. On and on and on, building up into a cascade of screaming echoes around my head. My heartbeat penetrates into my ears, thumping in my chest, so I'm sure I can see it beating, 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 pulsating through my skin like a bass drum being played by the fat guy in the band. Boom, boom. Boom! I know that one is short. Christ, of course I know. And I know that waiting at home is my family. And yeah, I know that I've promised a thousand times, a million times before that I would not, under any, any circumstances, ever 
have another bet. But the voices, the voices just won't go away and, and they're still calling out. Go on, go on. They're getting louder, stronger and stronger. If only the door hadn't opened just at that precise moment. If only she'd bought the food and nappies. It's all her fault. She caused this to happen. I want to take a deep breath and throw myself forward past that doorway because I know that I can make it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm so frigging good. I've passed it. No problem, no bloody problem. Yet they won't stop. They still will not stop. For Christ's sake, set me free. I can hear them. The voices from the bookies are playing tricks with my head. <laughs> They're telling me that... There's one last bet before the race begins. Go on, one bet won't hurt. One bet, last one, go on. I can hear the commentator. The guy knows my name. The frigging guy knows my name. I'm looking at the £20 note in my hand, turning it, twisting it, weaving it through my fingers. What if I put it on a lost? But then again, just saying that I won... Aye, what if that happened? Adrenaline's pumping through my veins and I can feel shock waves of excitement like when a drug addict gets his first fix of heroin. I should walk on, but I can feel myself slumping against the shop door. I want to walk on, I really do, but I can't. I can't. I know what you're all thinking. Just look how fat she is. Repulsive. Repulsive how I eat. Repulsive what I eat. Repulsive what I have to do afterwards. But you don't understand. I have to do these things. There are times when I can't get out of eating. And I just can't wait until I can lock the bathroom door, fingers thrust down my throat, waiting for the first heave to come. The first one is always the worst. There's been days when I've had up to 20 laxatives just to make sure that everything will have gone. I can't stand the thought of it inside of me, festering away building up little pores of fat. I hate the feel of food in my mouth. It feels dirty. Don't get me wrong, I love to cook food. It's just that I don't enjoy eating it. Sometimes, even watching others putting food into their own mouths makes me gip. It's not that I don't ever think about it. No, in fact, it's quite the opposite. I never stop thinking about it. But whilst I can keep focused on not eating, it blocks out other things. Painful memories. Things that... Things that I don't want to remember. You see, it's the only sure thing in life that I have total control over. I choose what goes into my body. And I choose what doesn't. It's a dark secret that I must keep from everyone. I must step onto those scales at least 20 times a day just to check that I haven't put any weight on. It was easy in the beginning. No one noticed. I'd cut my food up into tiny pieces, taking forever to chew each individual piece, or I'd just eat lettuce or vegetables. I became really good at lying, actually. Oh, I've, I've had dinner at a friend's, or I had a sandwich on my way home from school, or oh, it's fine, I'll get something whilst I'm out. Never once did I ever use the word diet. I used to buy magazines with these really skinny women in them, and I used to think, God, look how lovely they are. I bet they have perfect lives. I bet they're really happy. I bet everyone loves them. For ages, no one noticed. Then I fainted at school one day and was taken to the doctors. 
Do you know that they actually thought that I might be pregnant? Can you believe it? I had to strip off down to my underwear. And, and that was it. That's when the shit hit the fan. I couldn't believe the look on their faces. You know, my mum kept saying how thin I was. Christ almighty, where the chuff was she looking? Could they... No! Do they not see what I see? I'm so fat, grotesque, ugly chunks of fat. No one could ever like me. No one would ever love me looking like this. And they're trying to make me eat? Why can they not just leave me alone? I just want to be left alone. That's all. Leave me alone. Looking into the bathroom mirror, I notice the sunlight reflecting from it. It sends shadows across my face. A face that once smiled. A face that was once quite pretty. Not beautiful, but quite pretty. Now, a mask of blue and purple, tinted with hints of yellow and orange around the edges that mask out its frame. Quite beautiful in its own right, really. A couple more days and I wouldn't have to try and conceal it so much. A couple more days and everything will be back to normal. He doesn't mean to hurt me. He never means to do that. It's just work puts unnecessary pressure on him and I don't help. I should support him more, I know that. If I stand in front of the mirror and take off my dressing gown, the bruising along my ribs is almost gone now and breathing's much more bearable. It's not always been like this, you know. No, no, there was a time when he and I were happy. He'd do anything for me. He would, really, he would. Before we got married, that is. After that, things sort of became more... complicated. He wanted me to stop working. He said a wife's place was at home, looking after a husband. It was a bit old-fashioned like that. So was his dad. And I did look after him. I'd do anything for him. And did. Even the things that I can't tell anyone else about. You know, private things. He said that some things were private and shouldn't be discussed with anyone. Not that of anyone to discuss things with, that is. I can't remember the first time that he... Well, you know, I feel silly saying the words, really. Because after all, I think all women get hit or punched at some point, don't they? I mean, no woman wants to admit to anyone, not even herself, that sometimes you could be afraid of your own husband. No, he was right. There are some things that are private. Maybe things would have been different if I'd just had the strength to stand up to him. I hadn't meant for his coffee not to be hot that night when he came home from work. I know that he always prefers his drinks to be boiling and I knew that it was getting cold whilst he sat telling me about his day at work. I started to feel the first stabs of fear, you know the ones. The ones that that start in the pit of your stomach and slowly make their way up until you think that you're going to be sick or, or scream. Anyway, he picked up his cup and sipped at it, expecting it to be hot. I saw the look on his face, and I knew that no matter whatever I said, it was too late. There would be nothing I could do to stop the inevitable from happening. He got out of his chair, calm-like, and walked through to the kitchen. I heard the click of the kettle, the water boiling, and then he called me in. Can you come in here, sweetheart? I've something to show you. I knew that something was wrong. I also knew there was nothing I could say. It would just have made matters worse. When I walked into the kitchen, he was stood over by the sink. He had the kettle in his hand and a cup in the other. 
I watched as he slowly poured the water into the cup. He spoke gently all the time. I thought that this time I was going to get away with a warning. And then he said in a strange voice, he said, Do you know what boiling means? Yes, I replied. I asked him to sit down and I'd fetch him another drink. I reached out to stroke his face, thinking that I might be able to smooth things over a little bit. I'd soon learned how to do that not long after we were married. Like a puppy that had been kicked by its master, I too had learned how to crawl back. It all happened so quickly. He grabbed my arm and flung the cup of scalding water into my face. I lifted my other arm to try and protect myself. That's what fucking boiling is! You need to be taught a lesson. I didn't fight. There wouldn't have been much point. Instead, I just closed my eyes and waited. Please, God, please don't let there be anything else. I waited. He still held on to my other arm. This pathetic sound came out from me. Please, please don't hurt me. Nothing happened. I opened my eyes. I felt sure that nothing else was going to happen. The punishment was over. And I swear that as I looked at him, I saw what looked like tears collecting in the corner of his eyes. Then he slowly lifted the kettle and began to tilt it. He tilted it a little more. I closed my eyes again. No. You must look. You must understand that I'm only doing this because I love you. He leaned over and kissed me gently on the forehead. I begged. I pleaded again for him not to hurt me, to forgive me. I should have known that begging only adds to the pleasure that he receives from punishing me. The water came slow at first and I knew instantly that it added sugar into the boiling water. It sticks to the skin, you see. It felt as though my arm was melting. I'm sure that after I'd passed out with the pain, it would have stopped pouring. Strange thing is, when I came around, I was laid on the kitchen floor, and he'd placed my arm in a bowl of cold water. Strange, isn't it? Although I often find that an act of kindness follows a punishment with him. When he came home from work the next night, he showed great concern for my arm, but no mention of hospital was ever made by him, and certainly not by myself. That night in bed, after we'd made love, he put his arm around me. I felt frightened at first, I always will, I suppose. He kissed me gently on the head, and then he said to me, You know that I love you, don't you? Yes, of course I do. And he turned away, and I waited for the deepening of his breath to tell me that he was asleep. I turned over and buried my face deep within the pillow, and I cried and cried and cried but silently so as no one else could hear for some things are private 